Yes. <laughs> He's already on the list to be interviewed. Uh, so one of the things that uh, we wanted to try to work out in the working group was a common set of keys that we want to have in every config file or even in every section in every config file. Uh, for example, uh, if you want to disable a section, uh, whether that, you know, the obvious example we used for this one was the way package does it, although package is interpreting that enabled or disabled flag in package. Uh, but is there some way we'd want to be able to standardize how we do this? Yeah, the so guidelines on. This is the list of recommended names. If you want to have this kind of feature, then use this name. This kind of feature, use this name. But you cannot use yes, and if your feature is different, please avoid using this name yeah. and confusing people. Yeah. <laughs> and yeah, so I was hoping we might be able to come up with a, a list of some of the ones that we want to have as reserved words yeah. or whatever you want to call them. Or yeah. Call right. Because uh, the obvious ones I had were. Enabling disabling sections, for example, I don't know why, but you might want to turn off log rotation for one of the ones that's in the default. Or uh, the better example, I think, was uh, crontab. You have etc crontab, which has a bunch of default things. And if I want to disable one of those, I don't want to edit that file. I want to specify my override. This crontab entry should be disabled. Yeah. Uh, and so how we do that. And so I don't know how many applications might already have one of those in their config. And so do we have to try to somehow separate the FreeBSD specific keys out of stuff? Uh, hopefully not, because enabled equals yes is the most obvious. Uh, but I don't know. I can't think of any utility where that would really conflict, per se. But there might be some. Uh, and then, I don't know. I had a bunch of bad ideas. <laughs> 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 Neither do I, but I was hoping maybe maybe the bad idea would cause somebody to think of a better one, because that's so terrible they were just shocked. And Well, you can actually, if, instead of using the, um, the hash mark, if you actually use C style comments, you can come out of a range of text like that. No, but if you could have some syntax that would define the comment, but it right. was an annotation syntax, that is another piece of syntax that might potentially be useful. Because that's outside of the namespace of the thing right. that you might like to define. Yeah. Uh, hash experimental. Yeah, or uh, something like that. Right. And maybe that's the main position for your version as well. Yeah. Um, yeah, for a bunch of things, that does make sense. Yeah. Who, who wants to be note taker? <laughs> yes. But I don't think they can't hear you very well. So. What's the GitHub repository called? Uh, LibUCL. Uh, no, it's the stack up. Or Alan Jude has a fork of it. Yes? So I looked at the sections that you were scraping and they're forming some kind of a list usually. Uh, and that list is contained in some kind of other function, right? Uh, not usually. The sections are keys in a hash. I don't know how many elements would want to use it the way package 
well, my, my other example was like disabling a cron tab and a bunch of, and disabling a beehive VM so it won't start at boot up. Possibly, yes. Yeah. <coughs> Disable the default, yeah. Right, and it was just the example I had. I was like, are there any other keys that we can think of where we would want to have as like almost every config file might need this? Yeah. So like a macro dot delete key equals blah oh, or whatever. So dot disabled instead of dot delete or whatever. And it would just set a flag on the top level key saying this. You could do that if you had a macro that was delete this or whatever, um, which UCL provided the default definition for. And then if you actually wanted to be able to inspect the configuration, then you would. You could override that macro. Right. All right. And if you if you use it to programmatically edit the file, you want to delete the section that you've just disabled temporarily or whatever. Well, if you did it like GetOps, where you ran it before you did the regular processing, and it would only extract the keys that it knows really exist, and then leave the rest, so that, and then you could run your regular GetOps on it, and it would delete all the flags that you'd find, and then you would only have your keyword left, yeah. well, I, I or something. Right. Well, at least it's all like C++. I don't know. 
maybe someone becomes the or may, maybe we the mission which yeah. will show me I'm wrong. So. Yeah, maybe we just add the flag minus minus UCL and it expects a key value pair or something. Yeah. And then it doesn't get complicated. <laughs> But yeah, uh, so a dot delete to delete a section macro definitely seems interesting. And then maybe a dot disable that sets a flag on an object that, hey, this is disabled. Although I'm not sure what we do to actually emit it in that case. But Or rather, we want to avoid having the program have to check for the disabled flag as it's looping over every object. <laughs> That's definitely an interesting approach. Uh, so I've already described the includes and in, in, uh, priority system. So the include class model, mm -hmm. we probably want to provide some policy for an authority framework or to step against the state mm -hmm. that this is not an APA. Um, <laughs> and you know, never refer to file path. Whatever dot D slash. Yeah. I should probably be a free to on the upper on top of the UCL so that uh, we provide the kind of same predefined uh, usage of the UCL and it's our own directory. So it's nothing like the open source of the UCL. You never use the UCL directly, but you use a wrapper and the wrapper is going to become class automatically and stuff like this. It well, makes sense to have with, with the way I wrote it for you, you, in the C API, you can just provide it the list of paths. Yeah, but the idea is uh, you don't have to uh, write it each time in each right. tool. Then you have something which does the same the same thing by default. And right. Um, you reduce uh, you reduce uh, uh, code duplication. You reduce mm -hmm. uh, this this type of mistake, whatever. Yeah. So having the same wrapper on top of the UCL for all the tools on chain state makes a lot of sense. I think that's mm -hmm. a Yeah, and we have to what make a list of those. Is, um, an API that says something like default search path for access mm -hmm. tool name or whatever it is. Yep. Yeah. And it just gives you a list of mm -hmm. paths and on free DSP you can just find that on all places <coughs> and if you port it to other platforms you might use it some, some other way. Yeah. yeah. Please stop using S D default. Why? Which when you install the prep system is almost completely empty. 
No. Well, I guess it depends on user share cost. But the problem with user share is if you put uh, single a small thing where you just have flash and no user share, it's going to give you a lot in your uh, conversion. Yeah, or yeah, if you have a traditional FreeBSD uh, partitioning scheme in single user mode, you don't have user at all yet. Yeah. See, we're doing exactly so the opposite. Is we don't even have like flash scan. Yeah, I know we live in where we put it all in flash scan. Right? I don't for you. I can store it. Random. But yeah, for it's just like a historical distinction that we have half of the operating system separate from the other half of the operating system. For things like Beehive, it definitely makes sense for that to be in user share. Yeah. You know, some things maybe if but it's a lot of things that can actually be used. Yeah. Share. But and things critical to boot have to wait. Yeah. Uh, you know. Or user local share, of course. Yeah. Yeah. Local share. But user yeah. yeah. During boot, basically. Well, in bringing the system up to single user mode. Right. Because as soon as you. So you need rc.comp defaults and a couple of things like that, but you don't need. But if. Uh, periodic.comp probably doesn't need to be there. Well, even a lot of your init stuff doesn't really belong there. Cause right. Because it's in the user mode. And right. Exactly. Yeah. One of the config files I'm not proposing to change is fstat. <laughs> what? You mean that file that you don't have anymore? It's really sad. Yeah. <laughs> well, my swap's still in it. Well, actually, fstat should stay What's here that? because you don't have install a default uh, fstat. It's all in manual user version. So it doesn't yeah. match the, the, the use case. I mean, fstat is for user, not for. Right. Uh, user uh, Well, slash bin is what you need when you don't have networking, and user bin is when you have networking. Bin is single user mode, so things you need in single user mode. <laughs> But, but mostly it's because slash USR might not be there yet. So it's the tools you need to get slash USR working. <laughs> and so on. Yeah, I, I just wonder why you bring up this. Because we've always put them there. <laughs> well, I mean, there are lots of embedded things where it makes a lot of sense to have that distinction. Uh, even when you have a panic, or not a panic, but you have some problem on boot. Yeah, so, so the, the one I, I have, uh, it's got an 8 megabyte NOR flash on it. Yeah. And so I make a 6 megabyte compressed system, put it on there, yeah. and then the rest of it lives on a USB stick. And so everything I need to get up and mount the USB stick has to be in bin and S bin. 
And then. So basically, it's, you can do that. We just don't. Yeah. Uh, so then there's UCL CMD, which is my little command line utility uh, that lets you use libucl to do things. Yes, it does need a better name. Do you have a better name for it? <laughs> yeah, I, I thought about just UCL, but I, I didn't want to step on anything. But yeah. Just something short like UCL is, is, is fine with me. Yeah. Comp CTL. Hmm? <laughs> Stop it. <laughs> yeah, something like that. Just make sure it's something that the SIR yeah. didn't use single rated in it. Yes. Yeah, or that someone Googling for it is yes. updating up something else. Uh, which is another issue with UCL, kind of, but anyway. <laughs> yes. Oh, yes. Uh, you almost have me there. So uh, one of the things UCL CMD can do is output as shell variables. Because <laughs> this is the original, uh, the original thing I started with was a shell script to write the Beehive command line for me before I thought of just putting it directly into Beehive. Uh, and so I wrote one, a tool that would basically let me read a UCL config file and get the keys. Uh, and then I streamlined it with this, where it takes the UCL file and it spits out key value pairs or whatever. Um, but it also does some shell magic for if you have an array. So when you have two disks, uh, disk equals array, and when your shell script sees that, it knows to look for underscore length, and that tells it how many items, and you can just do a for loop for that many iterations and get each of the keys. And uh, when it's an object, it gets a big list of keys Again, that it can do a for loop over and automatically discover all of the stuff that's in your config file in a shell script. And you get that many no matter what. Like if you said five, and that's all you have, the other three get default values? Or? Other three. So this is just reading the config file. Okay. Uh, so here, I have. Uh, so it can just write the UCL script every. Yeah, sorry. Right. So this is this is the UCL config file that I have. Right? And you can see there are two different disks defined. One's actually flat one and one's thing. But uh, and then when you run the tool on it. Okay. <laughs> um, you can see that it actually just disks is an array because there was two of them. Uh, and there, so it tells you there are two uh, items in the array. The first one happens to just be a string. The second one's an object, which has these two or these three keys. And then you see that object has its three keys. So basically, it lets you take a UCL file and flatten it into environment variables that you can just deal with in your shell script. That was my original use case, so that's why I created that functionality. Uh, but it can do simpler stuff like. Uh, I just get a terminal here. You can just say UCL CMD get pointed at the FreeBSD. Uh, package repo and say, give me freebsd.url, and it will get the value of that out of the UCL file, which looks like, uh, oops. <laughs> All right, so there's what the UCL looks like, and I can just, you know, grab a key and get its value. Or I can specify that I would actually like the 
see equals value. Would well, you like to be able to specify the variables on the command line? To have it which, sorry? Uh, but, but my program doesn't know what package is going to interpret yeah, $ABI as. What you could say is probably having something that UCL, uh, and that means you're like uh, OCA and command line, so UCL can be uh, API equal job, and then all your command is API is your just like job. Ah, yes. That's, that's a good idea. To be able to yeah, give it the stuff. I love it. Love. I write it. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, so this allows you to easily extract individual pieces of information, uh, or you can actually do things like uh, that. Uh, so it has some basic features like iteration. Uh, so I, uh, that file's a bad example because it only has one tree in it, but I can pick a subtree and just give iterate over that. Or you know you can do other things like to get the key. I can just do keys, and it gives me only the list of the keys. And a couple other options it has like that. What are you conversing That's the one that I'm perfectly happy with. Uh, actually, kind of the, one of the main uses of this tool was inspired by sysrc, which is a tool to be able to edit your rc.conf programmatically. I, I've never used a Mac. Well, you should use the Mac page for it. Okay. Because it is really useful. Okay. Uh, and it actually documents the logic of how the um, user default system works mm -hmm. without forcing you to learn Objective-C. That sounds pretty good. <laughs> Might be considered a feature. Yes. <laughs> Uh, yeah, it, it could probably do that. Uh, currently, the syntax is UCL CMD set uh, to overwrite one. But like, so uh, here's an example of that, actually. That's not bad. Oops. Uh, That didn't work like it was supposed to. <laughs> Shouldn't have to. <laughs> oh, yes. Uh, I want to do. Your that didn't work at all. I'm doing the syntax wrong, apparently. Yeah, that was supposed to work, but it didn't. <laughs> oh. Yeah. There we go. Yes. No, it's actually it's my fault. I I didn't specify raw that it and so UCL was yeah my fault, not UCLs, but yes. Like I said, this is, I've, I've been writing C for like six months at the most here. And I've never even read a book. <laughs> so, uh. Have you read a book before? <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> I wrote one you can buy. <laughs> yes, it's nice. And so yeah, uh, that's mostly what it's supposed to look like, except for the backfiring. But you can see how it, uh, you can change the, although because like 75, we're not having the, uh, the shadow copy and stuff, it ate all the comments. <laughs> because my tool basically interpreted the config file, got the set of objects, modified it, and then emitted it as a new config file. 
All right, so that's one of the outstanding issues that needs to be solved still. But uh, Right. Um, then you have to respect it. Well, we looked at like having them as an, uh, a special object type that was just a string and then emitting them, but making sure they stayed in the right order and. Yeah. Yeah, because with with the C style comments, you can inject them in the middle of something. Because in UCL, this is allowed. That's perfectly acceptable. <laughs> oh, yes. <laughs> Which actually, as long as I had deleted both of them, would be acceptable. Yeah. Right. Like. I suppose. <laughs> yeah. For, the, the, for these other comments, we could easily just store them as a, a string object and then put them back in the right order. But for this thing, uh, it, would have to, it would end up before or after or on the same line or somewhere. It would get moved in that way, completely change the context of what that comment means. And so that doesn't really work. Yeah, because uh, one of the before I wrote this tool, one of my things I was thinking of is, well, if if libzo was set up quite right, I could just add a new emitter type for libzo of shell variables, <laughs> and then I would need all this stuff. <laughs> uh, but then I looked at the code for libzo, and it's all kind of in line. It's not like there's not a, a file over here that contains the JSON emitter and a file over here that contains the XML emitter, where I could just add my own. Uh, JSON doesn't allow comments at all. JSON doesn't. No. Right. Okay. So into my UCL CMD. Yes. So uh, yeah, this is uh, I took procstat and libzoed the entire thing. It's on reviews.freebsd.org if someone wants to approve it so I can commit it. <laughs> uh, and it gives you all the stats here about a process. And so you can just pipe that into UCL CMD and get, you know. Um, you can tag the, the text like MB saying this is the units for this value, but well, UCL has K and KB, and K is a thousand, KB is ten twenty four. Yeah. But UCL doesn't have units, does it? Like UCL just represents days as an integer where 
you're right. supposed to know it's the number of seconds, but right. you know, when you're writing files, you're we, we, in, in the use In the config file, you can write 5D, and it, yeah, so but it's internal. Yeah, so you can write 5D, but that turns into a number. There's yeah. no yeah. Right. preservation of the inputs. So here you can see I did uh, UCI, and I got proc set basic dot one dot login, where one, in this case, is the PID of the process. But, and I could get this that login field from the JSON output of libzo, and I got the one value I cared about for my shell script. One megabyte is, is yeah. <laughs> One megabyte is less than two kilobytes. <laughs> Can I uh, like tread a little on Please. the units thing, extended compliance? Sure. Uh, did you like use the normal SL uh, suffixes uh, or unit prefixes if you can do it that way? And the REC is like actual like KID. Uh, so that it's absolutely un unambiguous what that is. Because you yeah. could give me seconds. Or right. Yeah. Uh, and like lowercase k, but then like big M, big E, and so on and so forth. Right. Or you can go with number symbols that normally you want to say A and try to spell it. Megabits versus megabytes and stuff. And then whether it's about the essentially what they want to yeah. say on it. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So the B or the H or the E or the uh, patch protection would be units, so E is larger value. Yeah, I mean, like keeping the lowercase k, the big M, and all of that, um, well, changing it to a big M. Well, yeah, we definitely prefer to avoid case sensitivity, so I think we would have M and MI or something like that. M for a million and MI for 1024 times 1024. Why do you want to avoid case sensitivity? Yeah, because we might want to support mega and milli and milliseconds. Because uh, config files shouldn't be case sensitive, because that's a million. <laughs> Why do you want to be case sensitive? I, no, I just think if that's an know. assumption we're making, we should well, discuss that assumption because I right. think that's a bad assumption. Okay. You mentioned taking a, a parameters to a command line argument and basically making a config file. Well, if you go with one key, you can do that later. Right. Well, yeah. Okay. The keys are case sensitive. Yeah, the keys are case sensitive. The rest isn't. I just, I wouldn't want the meaning to change accidentally between M and M with an uppercase. But I suppose as long as we define what's what, then yeah, that can work. They want to add more units. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think we shouldn't yeah. be confused between million and mega. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Currently, we don't allow any units that are divisors instead of multipliers. Although, that's something we could fix. Yeah, so I might want to have milliseconds in mm -hmm. the configuration file. Yeah. What's that? I said a milli second is 12 days. <laughs> or uh, no, mega, maybe it's uh, yeah, maybe, right? Yeah, <laughs> maybe it would be yeah. like 104, blah, blah, blah. Yeah. A little over a million. 12 days. Yes. I would like to be able to specify what time it was for four minutes. Yes.
so then looking at stuff that we might want to do uh, UCL for, uh, obviously Beehive, which is coming along, although some of it's a bit rough and there might be better ways to do it. Uh, there is a review of it up on uh, reviews.previously.org, but it's an older revision. Uh, the newer one depends on some features in libucl that are not in the base system yet, and so they haven't been put into the patch because it doesn't compile. Uh, but that will be sorted. Uh, I'm not in a big hurry to change crontab, but it might be a good one to change. Uh, on my other slides for Monday, you see that if you change to something UCL looking like we did for um, uh, new syslog for a cron tab, it looks like exactly how you specify a cron tab in management systems like Puppet or, or Chef or whatever. Uh, you know, day equals this one and minutes equals that or whatever. Actually, the comment on Puppet uh, makes me wonder, um, are we planning to work with any of the upstream configuration management projects to help them with our adoption of this so that they don't have to do all the work. Right. Uh, well, part of the thing that compelled me to do this was once I could switch my puppet to use sysrc to set all my rc.conf stuff, uh, you know, it has, you call it with this and it tells you what the current value of that setting is. Puppet checks, is that right or not? And if it isn't, change it. And what if I could do that for every file? <laughs> and, and so, yeah, uh, providing the set of tools so that all the config management systems, you know, BSD would be the easiest one to deal with from now on. <laughs> Yeah. Or, or even going to them with the patch saying yeah. here. Yes, or the module or whatever they want, however their system works, being like, <laughs> here, this is how you canonically manage config files on BSD, and it just works. Look how easy it is. Don't you want to use yeah. their system? Exactly. Uh, and so um, the iSCSI and CLTD, those are both fairly new. So they're, uh, for the iSCSI demon, or the, for iSCSI client, the config file is kept the original format. Uh, but for the other one, it's new. And they're somewhat close enough that we could switch them to UCL before people get ingrained on using this other format. Uh, and AutoFS, again, that one's compatible with the old one. Uh, I don't know how much interest there is in changing that. But it's a brand new tool, so now would seem to be the best time to give it a different config file. It's a brand new tool that has a config format that can specifically yeah. Right, and so maybe it makes sense to just keep that. Uh, maybe not. Uh, and then FreeBSD update, uh, hopefully that'll just go away. <laughs> so you have UCL. Yes, so we'll just shoot that in the head. <laughs> uh, and then port snap. Uh, yes. Yay. <laughs> I really wanted to be able to get the exact ports tree that my packages were compiled with out of package. As a, yes. That's the idea. If someone wants to do it. I guess the biggest question is, do you do a P list for that? Because <laughs> it would be really big. Do you have to package the tree, though, or do you just need a file that has a revision? Well, I want to use the user what you can show people. Yeah. Yeah. It, it should be about it should, no. Well, it, it should be about the same size as a tar file of the port tree, which is how you used to get it, right? Mm. Or it it shouldn't be much bigger than the one that tar snap downloads the first time, or port snap downloads the first time. Right, it will be smaller than that. Which is actually the biggest thing. Yeah, uh, and then there are a couple that are a little trickier. Uh, Jail.conf. Uh, first of all, it has references to variables that were set previously in that file, and UCL doesn't support that yet. Uh, also, it has some of the keys have dots in the name, which isn't allowed in JSON and currently doesn't quite work with uh, the dot notation, although I've added functionality to UCL so that you can use something other than dot as a separator when you're doing the object notation to select a sub key, uh, since the key names could have dots in them, and that breaks everything.
a hierarchy, yeah. So, yeah. Is Jamie here? Yeah, right. yeah. hi. <laughs> to further complicate that one, a feature that doesn't have but has been asked for, and I said I would do years ago and never did, um, to include files also based on variables. Mm. You know, I want to include jail.comp.myhost. Yes, or, you know, something that my ho the yeah. host name of my jail or whatever. So put those self referencing variables even in the include meta to yeah. make it worse. Yes. Uh, and the other one is there are some keys that don't have a value, right? It's like yes. mount.allowNFS or whatever, yeah. uh, which basically is an <laughs> implicit Boolean. Yes. Can we make it explicit? <laughs> or do we have to try to teach UCL to understand implicit Booleans? Um, well, possibly could make it explicit. Uh, yeah. Cool. That's, that's part of the, uh, what are allow blah equals on? Yeah. It, well, actually, you can make it explicit right now. Right. It's just not the way it's normally done, but it, it yeah. understands the explicit ones. Okay. Because one of the biggest drawbacks to jail.conf now is a shell script can't parse the middle of the config file. I can't, I can't extract one value that's nested very easily. True, yeah. yeah. Although UCL CMD would let you get them, although, as you saw, trying to set them is a little explosive at the moment. <laughs> Indeed. Yeah. But ideally, we'd be able to do that as well. Uh, WPA supplicant mostly works except for... Uh, the key name in the top level, you do network and then stuff, network stuff. Uh, and so the implicit array problem is, is an issue at the moment. But the other one is uh, you can't select based on the network name currently. Because that's a key inside. And everyone, every section is called network. And then they have the primary key inside. And I don't know if we want to change that or just try to make it parse it, the <coughs> file the way it is already which is close enough to being uh, UCL compatible. Yes. Doesn't make a lot of sense. Uh, and the problem with devd.conf is that it has a key and then two or three values uh, that are space separated, and so that doesn't really parse. Uh, I think it's just a horrible compass file format. Yeah. In many ways. Mm -hmm. The man page is not very informative. Yeah. So replacing it with something that is human readable would be nice. Mm -hmm. Something that was writable would be better. Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Which one? So the whole other thing that you say is this value is basically in special and override this other value over here. Which one, sorry? Login, login oh, login.com. Yeah, that one's special. <laughs> well, that one you can see easily with the because you have to tap into the DB. So you can just have get, uh, tap into the DB, uh, having it put into the UCL file, and then you can put one one with the other. Mm -hmm. Because uh, unless you will just read the Right. Yes. Are you going to change to login.com frequently? Yes. Uh, and also. Or C because we don't know anything other than D. Yeah. I think Colin had to change the default set of paths to remove the games directory as well. And version. Uh, I saw it in Merge Master. Uh, I changed my password crypt to bcrypt. <laughs> Although you can't currently specify the number of rounds, which is really annoying. But that's a completely separate issue. But login.conf is a proper example where you need something valuable somewhere and you just have your overrides that you would like to make. Has the DB file instead of the 
for speed. Same way your password file has one, right? Well, I think it's, it's because you can have an index in a database, right? So you can more quickly look up a specific entry. So maybe we could get rid of the database I don't know. I, I don't think you want to put, I don't think anybody's putting UCL in libc. Uh, so one of the other things was uh, maybe actually building a BAPS idea of a super API over top of UCL. But an easier way to, to reduce some of the duplicate code of taking the UCL and putting it into however the application deals with its config file, whether that's the C struct or using UCL objects directly or whatever. Uh, and what should it look like? Because uh, giant ELSIF ladders of STIRCOMS is not fun. And having to write a complete callback for every possible key is also a lot of legwork. Oh, uh, Devin has something called libfigpar, but I don't know what it is. But, but apparently, it, it could do something into the structs. I don't know. Uh, so I think. Yeah, it passes the progression by the way. Oh, yeah. I mean, I think for a language like C, mm -hmm. you, you're just going to have to bite the bullet and say, if you want to do the, uh, the shiny auto thing, then you have to do the uh, you know, auto generation of marshalling code thing. Uh, I mean, there's no way around that. Right. <laughs> For our call correctly, libfigfar is what he came up with after I wanted something like sysrc that could do sysctls. And since sysrc is written in shell, you cannot have variable names with dots in them. And so it doesn't work for sysctl or loader.comp variables that are sysctl-like. Anyway, uh, so looking at the two different ways I did it, uh, with new syslog, I used the existing struct and shoehorned the, uh, the validation code and the loading it into the struct uh, by writing a callback for each struct member that does the validation and then loads it in. Uh, although it probably could have been done as load it all into the struct and then validate and decide what to do. Uh, and then, so that was a bit more plumbing, uh, but for some programs that makes sense, right? Because I had to, I didn't have to disturb any of the actual functional code uh, in 
new syslog, so I most likely didn't introduce very many bugs. <laughs> uh, with Beehive, because it was basically just all over the place, uh, we created a new struct and stored it all there, although maybe we could have just you know, kept the UCL object around and, and grabbed the specific information out of it as we needed it instead. Um, but part of it was we maintained backwards compatibility with the command line stuff, which we just made set the values of the struct, uh, although we could have made it create UCL objects in the right place as well, I suppose. Uh, and then some of the validation is done during parsing. Uh, so when we read the config file, we check, you know, is this the expected type and so on. And then later, when Beehive goes to use it, it checks whether that's actually a sane value. And so the validations in two different places is probably not very good. Uh, like, for example, um, the number of, uh, when you're specifying the location on the PCI bus for where you're putting your disks and so on, uh, it has, my code has some magic so that you don't have to specify if you don't want to. Uh, but, you know, you can end up having more devices on the bus than you're allowed or something like that. Uh, where the validation doesn't trip on that until you actually go to create the eighth device or, or the eighth function on the device or whatever. The feature that you said in chat that might be useful to consider is um, as part of the schema we do have like the valid button. Uh, we also support new version designs mm -hmm. uh, and we support a new version for the numerical value fields. Ah. Uh, and we even have a scanner that will rip through the enums in your C program and turn them into enums in zip and then turn say, okay, uh, it can be a value from this enum type and you can write the string and it will pop out enums. And that cool. works for both. What did I want that for? Yeah, I wanted that for I wanted that inside UCL uh, for the target variable on one of my new macros. Anyway, uh, yeah. So Beehive uses the stir comp ladder instead of the uh, map of fun uh, key name to function to call. Uh, I don't know which one's worse, <laughs> or which one offends people less or whatever. Uh, the ladder is open Yeah. But they're both realities of C. Yeah. Uh, and then with the way I did Beehive, I used a little feature I added to UCL, and maybe it wasn't such a good idea. Uh, when we first came up with the what the config file for Beehive would look like, uh, the concept was to have one config file for each VM that would just live somewhere. And when you, call, when you start up Beehive, you would just specify the path to that config file. Uh, but I was like, that maybe doesn't make sense, and what if I want to start all my VMs at boot time or whatever? And so I changed it to be one big config context that included many files or whatever, and then you just call Beehive and the name of one of the beehives that, that exist in that context. Uh, but in order to keep the config files from being nested and let you just put CPUs equals four, uh, if you put a config file in etc beehive.conf.d and call it you know, blob.conf, uh, when it gets included in the final config, it actually shows up as section blob with all your values in it. But that's not the way .d normally works. So I'm not sure that's such a good idea. And I also realized after, uh, and so anything you specify in etcbeehive.conf becomes a default that applies to every VM that doesn't explicitly override that. Um, but the problem with that is when you create default devices, which happen to actually be a section, that would actually also be interpreted as a VM called default, or a VM called device, which might not cause, it might cause quite a few problems too. So like in, in beehive.conf or in one of the .d files, you can do my VM set is a section and then all the settings. And you might uh, actually want to have a .d slash sections. Or something like that. that model, yeah. And then the things in .d that don't just use. Yeah, so have different like. Different types include directives, right? Like yeah, include so. Include smooch together and yeah. include as sections. Yeah, I think, I think it was, I called it. Yeah, I call it, I think it's uh, prefix or nested or something like that. Yeah. 
Uh, but yeah, so maybe beehive.conf.d slash vms, and that's, everything in that file becomes a VM called that name, whereas in the root of beehive.conf, they're just snippets that get stuck into the root. No, uh, the way it would work now uh, is you would have I can, you would have like this. Right. I can't type, and so on. Yeah, like you can, you can have that. Right, okay. So that's what I'm saying. Now, mm -hmm. let's say that that's the default config, and then like at yep. the bottom you include something else. Um, what goes in that other file to add a new VM to VM? Uh, it would be, yeah, so if you dot include <laughs> whatever, that file would have VMs uh, and VM1. And if it has some new setting, That'd be fine. Um, and then if I want to add a new one, I just click the new one. Yeah, and you can just have PM3. So it's basically a merge. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Although, it, when you do the include, uh, one of the optional arguments here is the priority. Right. If they're the same, then things get uh, merged. Or, well, if there's a conflicting key and the priorities are equal, it actually becomes an array by default which might not be the right behavior currently. Uh, and and then, but it, it depends on what you're doing. Like, because in this case, if you have two VM1s, they should actually be merged. Uh, or if you have two VMs, right, they, you want to. You need to specify. So. Yeah. yeah. It could be create new section, it could be Merge with the existing section, or it could be overwrite. Or it could be the existence of the same key in two VMs. Yeah. Yeah, so maybe merge equals overwrite, or merge equals append, or merge equals error, or whatever. Yeah. It's also quite yeah. the odd that the way for modifying the existing VM uh, is indistinguishable from having it contain the new VM that wasn't there before. Yeah. I don't know how to make them different, really, though. Right. Is it not based on this responsibility to see what the default is? Well, and, and more importantly, there's a tool that we haven't written yet that will actually show you what the final yeah. config will look like by compiling all of it together. But yeah. Yeah, and it would annotate every line telling you which file it came from. Right. And if one is supposed to 
Like imagine those uh, braces were there. Mm -hmm. Well, it, uh, it really doesn't make a difference if you put it all in VMs or not, but yeah. Um, so I guess like, just like you were saying, like dot to VM2. Yeah. Like dot, dot new or dot modify. Right. Uh, to say that explicitly, like you kind of, and then you would get an error if you don't say that. And then you would get, you know, if you did a copy and paste thing. Right, so here, if, if we had... Uh, So if we had merge set to error, then like you can't redefine VM1 because it already exists, but you can dot delete VM1 and now define it fresh. Or dot merge VM1 and then right. Yeah. So you, you could specify it as the include or in line, which is definitely good because if you're not supposed to modify the default file, then you can't go in and change the merge mode, but you might be able to override it for a specific section. Right. Override or replace. Yeah. Yeah. Call it dot replace, and then you can. It has a, a argument that's whether or not it's fatal if it doesn't already exist. Well, I mean, I think you'd want to replace attribute or merge attribute. Right. That is a property of that AST node rather than right. a macro. Right. Yeah. So. Merge. Right. Ultimately, be I don't care if the thing already exists or not. Right. And then the difference between saying VM one should now be this object and VM one should, should be should have these properties overridden. Yeah. Or yeah. As, as you're looping deeper, yeah. This is the problem I ran into with the merge command in UCL CMD, <coughs> is how do you decide how deep you want to merge and how deep you want to replace? Well, there's, there's two possible answers there, neither of which would be directly include. One is yeah. actually coded in the CMM, the other is that you have to use your code to replace the file. Yeah. So it's a different answer. Or it can't be both, and then you can override the default in the CMM. Yeah. Okay. Does it make sense to give a symbolic name for a priority? Uh, that isn't a bad idea. Cur currently, the yeah, currently the priorities range from zero to fifteen, uh, because we use the top couple of bits of the flags field <laughs> to store it. Uh, <laughs> because our the the UCL object fits exactly in a cache <coughs> line or something, right? Yeah. So we didn't want to make it any bigger. Okay. Um, and the default is zero. I originally wanted to change the default to something so that you could slide a config file in underneath where it would provide defaults but not overwrite anything. Uh, so there's, in the C API, you can provide a different default, but the default default is still zero. Uh, but. So one other thing that you always could change is could you change the ellipse UCL? Mm -hmm. Yes. 
Uh, it's currently using JSON. Uh, when Kip asked, or Kip asked me originally, I couldn't wrap my head around the Apple code enough because I was just starting to learn C at the point. Uh, but now, looking at what he's done and where he's calling the JSON library or whatever, it should be fairly simple to swap out all the JSON for uh, UCL. And it will still read all the JSON files that they might already be using, but instead will also read UCL, and, which is better. Is that why I couldn't understand it? Uh, Jason, like J A S S O N or something like that? Jansen, yes. Yes, because you did the benchmarks on the page, right? So. Right, because when you did those benchmarks, we were still using linked lists, not the vectors, right? Yeah, instead of uh, khash. It, it is. It, it can it can parse JSON already, as we saw with the thing. I know that, but if you want JSON, UCL's parser is twice as fast as Jensen. But if I need, but if I need syntactically valid JSON, then let UCL. Uh, right. The idea is that config files shouldn't be written in UCL, so we should replace. Like, Launch the originally used XML binary plist or some crap, and and like we don't want an XML parser in. In it, so we'll use Jansen. It's like, whoa, well, whoa, whoa, hang on. There's, right. there's a distinction there, right? There's, right. Uh, you may not want an XML parsing running as part of an it. Right. You might very well be happy to have an XML parser that creates a binary blob, which gets right. loaded by okay. three different things. And system D also, you know, is that distinction. That's an important okay. one. And also, XML property lists are not, they don't need a full XML parser. Right. The, the port of LaunchD that's working on previously that I've seen uh, uses Jansen for JSON and could easily be swapped out for UCL. Uh, and I think that would be the better. Because then the config files could be written in something that's human readable. Oh, I see what you're saying. Yes. Yeah. Yes. We're not, we're not replacing uh, the JSON parser with our thing just because. It's because we'd actually rather use UCL than JSON because config files should be readable and writable by Humans and monkeys. Okay. <laughs> All right. That's um, so yeah, we use Jamon OS 10 as of 10.9 for JSON as well. So cool. they can transform the JSON. Right. They used to before. Um, they used to be for open step property lists. And JSON is basically open step property lists. It's just changed there slightly to get around the two possible copyright restrictions. Right. the other tool you said before? You had another tool to, oh. Is there anything else? OK. Ah. That one will be fun.
Yes, because my, my, my nine jails work fine on 10, except for Socstat and Netstat and a couple of things. Like Yep. Which one? It, it's right there. Oh. Oh. So while it is useful to create an ordered list of priorities, I yes. think the long-term goal should be you might list two or three config files in the base or system that we will not yes. use the yellow file. Because if we're going to have a common configuration It should be everything be except, then, yeah, okay. Yeah. Uh, Uh, yeah, I guess I don't do, do you parse uh, FSTab in libc somewhere or anywhere? I, I was under the impression FSTab was read through libc in some cases, but I could have just made that up in my head. Well, I mean, I don't have an FSTab anymore. Right. <laughs> but well, like, the mount command looks at it somehow. I just yeah, don't know how. In the same way you read login.conf is similar, right. similar interface. So The, uh, which one, sorry? ZFS. What about ZFS, sorry? That it currently has this, uh, tell me all the properties of the stuff. Right. Set all the properties of the stuff. Yes. And actually, I'd like to be able to say, give me a UTL file containing the properties of all my files that have been now implemented, and download the package. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to replicate this setup. Yeah. Those uh, Matt Ahrens was not opposed to the idea of making ZFS to have libzo to be able to output the properties as JSON or XML or whatever. But being able to read it back in libzo yeah. is quite useful. I, I yeah. find that machine readable formats are quite useful for, for everything, yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so. Well, yes, because um, at, at Asia BSDCon, uh, one of the ideas that uh, Paul Schenkevelt proposed uh, before he passed away was uh, something so that in the end, when you're sitting on a FreeBSD machine, you could get something like you get on a Cisco, show running config, and you would get the configuration for the entire machine. Uh, maybe nested by the daemons or whatever, but you'd be able to basically compile out a config of everything the same. Which one? Right. Okay. So once you set that up yeah. on this list, yes. I mean, so far it's blank. Yes. And I think maybe it should stay that way. But do people have candidates of things yes. that Is they maybe could not UCL? I, I don't see a reason. Right. FS tab could be more sensible and, oh, if it's supposed to be the second field and the third field, I mean, why yeah. have that? That's and uh, my path is this long, so now all the fields are pushed off the end and they can't even read yeah. the bloody so thing. You listed that as the canonical example of the thing you would never want to change well, the format of, and I think one, not. Okay. And if you have yeah. any things that would be on this list, uh, um, things like the uh, password database. Right.
Uh, password, so actually, like, the pwd.db is the one that we wouldn't change. Yeah, we'd change that. Yeah, but anything that's loader.conf, perhaps? That, that, yeah, so rc.conf and loader.conf. Those can stay. What's that? Right, so, so you would, uh, so we could change the format of, well, when you call, like, get ants or whatever to get, to map a user ID to a username. Does that read pwd.db or a password file directly? It should be OK. OK. And is that a binary file like this? Yeah, that one is binary. Yeah. But so that shouldn't be on the list. Yeah, right. That's yes. not a configuration file. Yeah, I, I was changing. So the password file could actually be changed, is what you're saying. Yes, yeah. OK. This is this is things you're not changing. Oh yeah, sure. We're not you said not changing RC dot com would make sense to not be a shell script. Yeah. It should be RC dot com is interpreted by RC, so it's fine. I'm perfectly happy with it the way it is. Other things happening, yes. So. <laughs> yeah, so you know, if, if we had launch D, then maybe we don't have RC like that. <laughs> Is there anything else that, well, like the AutoFS one, that we, you know, that's compatible with another format on purpose? So even the, yeah, so I think there are tools where there's compatibility with the historic way we did it. There's compatibility with what other people are doing. Yeah. Right. Now, if it's a format that isn't changing, then there's not a lot of extra maintenance overhead to just keep the old format as an option. Right. right. If it's exactly. a format that is rapidly iterating and we're trying to maintain compatibility with other people, that becomes a problem. Yeah. Uh, the AutoFS one is interesting because um, you know, on the one hand, you sort of want to be able to share these config files between free BSD and the But also, there are some things in the ports tree which let you manage Android devices. And it would be really nice to plug those into AutoFS so when an Android device is plugged in on a USB port, it's mounted somewhere. And that should be a thing that comes with the port and is installed in AutoFS.d. Right. So that one's kind of yes and no at the same time. Kind of like, like we did kind of with uh, new syslog and just say the etc file gets read in the old format, but this .d directory over here is read in the new one. SSH, I don't think we, yeah, SSH, we can't go diverging anymore. <laughs> yeah. yeah, that's, uh, what was the one you just said, sorry? Like all the things like, uh, ah, yes. Uh, host name is set in rc.com from FreeBSD. <laughs> um, Which one? Pam. Ah, Pam. <laughs> so I think that's you know one of those really yeah. individual. Uh, uh, maybe all of these should have question marks by them. But yes. <laughs> it's probably up to the Pam maintainer. I think the Pam maintainer maintains the portable version of Pam. Yes. Or. or
Yes, well, when we control the portable version, it's a little easier to actually change the config file format. <laughs> but, uh, you will all use <laughs> what we say. Uh, but I guess, yeah. Is there anything else that? Well, the provisions would only make sense if you enforce the deed. Right. Because otherwise, it also means that you can use the function that needs to order. Right. So, like, uh, um, There's one S or two S's? Well, NSS3 still has a QNX problem. Which one? The NSS3.com still has a QNX problem. Right. So you cannot switch. Right. This, it's on the oh. do not change list. Again, I know it's on top. Yeah. Later. Which one? Martin. Oh. Yeah. Uh, that one's actually, I added a, another macro for baptiste.load where you can load a whole file in as a string into a config file. And Modto was my example. That's not a config file. Yeah, it's, that's just a text file. But we could make it a config file. It could have font equals Comic Sans. And <laughs> Fortune is in the base system now, isn't it? No, it's not. Oh. Um, there is a way to use different message of the days for different users, but that's in PAM or SSH or something. Anyway, it's login.conf, I think, actually, controls which message of the day you see when you log in. It's actually login. It's in login. Login.conf, login yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's obviously. <laughs> Yeah, it that, it'd be covered by a conversion of login.com to UCL. So. But yes, we can really fork our version of PF. <laughs> yeah. Which one? Yeah, uh, I'm not touching send mail. Screw you. <laughs> <laughs> yes. And yes. Yeah. Right. Although, I suppose we could. Oh, yes, by UCL by default, I guess. Yeah. Uh, it's, it's JSON. It's key value <laughs> pairs. I don't know if an at sign's allowed in. There'd never be an at sign in the key anyway. It's always in the value. So, yeah, it's <laughs> completely fine. It's already UCL. And that creates a DB, yeah. But, yeah. <laughs> um, what's the other one we're just talking about? Yeah. <coughs> well, that's, yeah, I, there's not much where you really don't want it, I suppose. Kind of the point, right? <laughs> it might be, yeah, useful to have a list of principles. Like yes. In, until we can make everybody else adopt UCL2. Right, yeah. Until it's written by someone else. Yeah. What about the pen uh, Currently, that's managed as a symbolic link to a yeah, thing. and well, that's a copy of the data. Yeah, and it's like libc2, right? So. And that's a powerful one that really needs yeah. Well, isn't, isn't that one of the things that Apple did in, with LaunchD was like, hey, we don't need to check the time zone 100 times a second every time we do calls to this function or that function.
German is interesting in ZFS because it supports the locales for it, and all of a sudden the output isn't the same. In particular, uh, decimals become commas, which don't mean the same thing anymore. <laughs> Which one? Bones. I don't think we have that. Oh, okay. We probably don't need them anymore. Which one? Oh, yes. That one's got a confusing name. Oh, mine's got even more stuff in it because I'm using PCBSD. Uh, oh, BS and MPD, yeah. But yeah, basically everything, I guess. <laughs> Anybody have any? I do, uh, the, like the first couple we should do that would be really good examples <laughs> so that we get better buy-in from people. Can you go back to the list? Okay, well, yeah, those are the ones we thought of so far, obviously. But. So are you now saying you want to put them in a priority order? Well, not necessarily. I was just saying it, our, what, one where it would be a really good example of the power of it to can help convince people that are on the fence about the idea. Yeah, uh, I started. I picked it because it's something that hasn't changed in a while. It's something that doesn't share a format with anything else ever. How and old is this new And isn't that a Linux developer that wrote it? <laughs> yeah. Yes. What? what? LS doesn't have a config file. What are you talking about? So users that want color have color. Yeah, Beehive. Oh. I thought he was saying VI at first too. I was like, no, I don't even use the Beehive. Yeah, maybe it's on Emacs. So. <laughs> yeah. Right, so I guess in the schema, where do we put the C type that it ends up being stored at, is, I guess?
as uh, I do projects for people that want to join. Yep. We have a workshop pack up. So we have picked one of those by the event. And, um, some of those could turn into uh, some of our projects which are still on the way. Some of them could be uh, we have coding as well. And they are simple. And so yeah, so a lot of them are simple enough that in a weekend hackathon you could finish. Yeah, you could have this on Hackathon you can have this on uh, on uh, Young Students for Google Coding. You yep. can have this on a lot of things like last year for the coding we didn't have enough actual coding projects. So yeah. it's just really useful for the Yes. Yes. Uh, I have dinner plans. <laughs> Were we? Oh, sorry. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> Why are you clapping? You did the work. <laughs> Let's wait for ourselves.